heteronomical mechanisms that are happening in the dense regions of the cluster that is stripping the gas out of those galaxies and making them H1 deficient and quenching the uh, star formation in them. So in the right, we are looking at uh, the Virgo galaxies. So in blue, we are looking at the H1 disks uh, 10 times magnified. And in orange, we are looking at the hot X-ray emitting IECM. So we see that close to the center of Virgo, the H1 disks are smaller or absent. And here we are looking at some peculiar H1 disks from H1 Rogue's gallery. And here we also see some examples of tidal interaction or post-merger remnant or free floating H1 clouds uh, in some galactic system that uh, actually signifies there must be some environmental mechanisms happened in the recent past. So H1 disks are the fuels of star formation. They're spatially extended. They're kinematically cold and collisional, and they reach far out to the dark matter halo where gravitational potential is not strong enough. That's why H1 gas disks can be very easily stripped out of the galaxies. And that makes them very sensitive pressures of astrophysical mechanisms. Uh, uh, to also inspect the internal structure of the galaxies, the kinematics, the dynamics, the different gas accretion and consumption mechanisms. Uh, so what was found in Vargo was also found in other nearby clusters in the work by Solanes et al. Uh, here we are looking at a plot where in the x-axis we see the projected distance from the cluster center and in y-axis we see the fraction of H1 deficient galaxies. So we calculate the H1 deficiency as a difference between the expected and the observed H1 mass. And uh, the expected H1 mass is mostly calculated from the optical properties. So what we see here is closer to the centers of these clusters, uh, there are more H1 deficient galaxies. So there must be some kind of stripping mechanisms happening closer to the centers of these clusters uh, that is making these galaxies so H1 deficient. There are a couple of astrophysical mechanisms uh, that generally happen in the clusters. One of them is Rampersha stripping. Here we see one example of Rampersha stripped galaxy from my published paper. In black contours, we see H1 emission. And in grayscale, we see H alpha uh, emission. So we see that the H1 tail is much more extended um, than the H alpha. And uh, here we see famous example of tidal interaction in M81 group. Here we see uh, thermal evaporation, the cold H1 gas is being evaporated by the hot halo. And here we see famous example of H1 accretion in the outer disk of this galaxy. Uh, so I will now focus on one particular mechanism, ramp pressure stripping and the jellyfish galaxies because I work a lot with them. So jellyfish galaxies are extreme examples of ramp pressure stripping. Ramp pressure stripping happens when a galaxy uh, moves towards the center of the cluster and experiences a hydrodynamic pressure called ramp pressure by the hot intercluster medium. And if the ramp pressure is more than the gravitational uh, potential of the galaxy, then the star forming H1 gas can be stripped out of the galactic disk. And that creates a tail like structure. And often in those uh, tails, there are lots of recent star formations happening. Until recently, there were only a handful of jellyfish galaxies observed in the nearby clusters. But IFU has revolutionized this field. And now we have information about jellyfish galaxies in a lot of different clusters. Here we see some textbook examples of jellyfish galaxies. Um, D100 in coma cluster, where we see a very long extended H alpha tail coming out of the stellar disk. Here on the right, we see famous example of ESO137. Though in HST image, we do not see any obvious tail. But uh, when we look at H alpha, we see a very dramatic uh, H alpha tail coming out of this galaxy. Targeted H1 observations of jellyfish galaxies are also very important and introduced very recently, mainly by the GASP collaboration. And uh, targeted H1 observations of jellyfish galaxies are very important because as I mentioned before, H1 disks are really powerful diagnostic tools for environmental processes. So here ends my introduction part. And then I will discuss about JVLA observations of uh, some jellyfish galaxies. So GASP, this acronym stands for Gas Stripping Phenomena in Galaxies. Uh, 
the main motivation of uh, our survey is to uh, have the statistically significant sample of jellyfish galaxies and to understand when, where, and how gas removal occurs and to quantify the amount of star formation during the whole process of stripping. And uh, we have uh, ha have uh, 114 uh, muse ob ob observations of the galaxies that are having a range of stellar masses and the range of morphologies and environments. Here, this chief is blinking between the optical and the H alpha image of the GASP sample. Five of the most striking jellyfish galaxies were also observed with JVLS ERA to observe the H1 content in them. And each of these jellyfish galaxies were in different clusters. So each of these clusters were observed. And we have detected total 18 H1 sources in these five clusters, including the jellyfish galaxies. And one of the jellyfish galaxy was not detected in H1. And I worked on one particular H1 observation of one particular jellyfish galaxy, JO204. JO204 is a massive uh, galaxy in a moderately massive cluster, Abel 957. Here on the top, we are looking at the optical image, the H alpha image, the H alpha kinematics, and the BPT diagram of uh, JO204. And uh, here we can see very clearly that the H alpha tentacles are coming out of the stellar disk of this galaxy, uh, signifying the signatures of Rampersha stripping. And BPT diagrams are basically the characteristic line ratios that hint at the corresponding ionization mechanism in different parts of the galaxy. So here in the center of GO204, we see it is mostly uh, affected by AGN ionization because there is one AGN in the center and here we see a uh, AGN ionization cone. And here we are looking at the 3D, uh, sorry, 3D uh, cube of uh, Mu's observation, uh, a Mu's cube of uh, GO204. And um, we, are, we have detected GO204 both in H1 emission and absorption. And here in the right, it is blinking between the H alpha map and the H1 absorption in blue and in white dotted uh, lines, we see H1 uh, absorption. And uh, as we can clearly see that the H1 emission is way more extended uh, than the H alpha emission. And here um, in the bottom, we are looking at the different velocity channels and we are looking at the different phases of gas. So in black, we see H1 emission, in red, we see H1 absorption, and in grayscale, we see H alpha emission. So for example, in this velocity channel, we see there is no H1 associated with H alpha. In this velocity channel, we see H1 is offset from H alpha, and in this velocity channel, we see H1 and H alpha co-located. So that means the tail of this jellyfish galaxy is extremely turbulent. As I mentioned before, we have also detected H1 in absorption in this galaxy against the 11 milligenski radio loud AGN. And here we are looking at the H1 absorption profile. This is the systemic velocity. So we can see that the H1 absorption profile is asymmetric with the redshifted wave. So that means that between us and GO204 galaxy, H1 gas is moving towards the GO204 galaxy. It can be because of two reasons. One is probably the H1 gas is moving at a very high velocity in front of the small but extended radio continuum source. The other reason can be probably ramp pressure is pushing the gas towards the AGN and uh, uh, that's how it's triggering the AGN activity. Poyajanti et al. has found a very strong correlation between ramp pressure stripping and AGN activity. Six out of the seven jellyfish galaxies in their sample actually hosts AGN. So we were really interested to investigate what physical mechanism is driving this redshifted wing. And that's why we actually modeled the H1 absorption profile, assuming similar kinematics of H1 and H alpha gas. And here is the result. Um, in the gray scale, we see the model absorption profile and in black, we see the observed H1 absorption profile. So we see that the model H1 absorption profile is more extended than the observed H1 absorption profile. So the model absorption profile is consistent with the rotation as expected from Tully Fisher. So we cannot actually rule out either of these two mechanisms, unfortunately. And here uh, I have made a cartoon of this galaxy showing the complex uh, physical mechanisms happening in it. 
I can come back to this later, but I would also like to talk about the other project. So for now, I'll move on. So the take home from this chapter is jellyfish galaxies have, have high stellar masses and they're very special case uh, because they're very uh, close to the cluster core and they're very H1 deficient. It is very difficult to detect them in H1. And the extended jellyfish tails are also uh, like detected in multi-phase. They're detected both in H1 and H alpha. Now I would like to virtually move from the desert of Sokoro to desert of Karu in South Africa. And I would like to talk about our exciting Meerkat H1 observations of ABLE 2626 galaxy cluster. ABLE 2626 is a moderately massive galaxy cluster located in the southern part of the Perseus Pegasus filament. The main motivation of observing this galaxy cluster was because it hosts six jellyfish candidate galaxies. And we already have a wealth of ancillary data uh, for this galaxy cluster. And we have conducted additional MMT uh, redshift survey uh, to, uh, to have additional redshifts for 2,300 uh, galaxies. And here we are looking at uh, the optical uh, redshifts uh, in the brain redshift range covered by our Meerkat survey. So in green, we see the cluster itself. In orange, we see a collection of groups, which we call the swarm. And in magenta, we see another cluster, ABLE 2637. And here we see the sky distribution of those galaxies. I will come back to this distribution later. Healy Wilner has also identified the substructures uh, within this surveyed volume by DS test, and they have found a couple of substructures in each of these uh, different environments. And uh, we had a single meerkat pointing in this ABLE 2626 volume. Meerkat is an extremely sensitive telescope located in South Africa. It is twice as sensitive as VLA and uh, with its 64 antenna and 64 uh, and uh, eight kilometer baseline. Um, it is one of the uh, SK precursor telescopes. And we had a single meerkat pointing of uh, 15 hours on the target and we covered a field of view of 56 arc minutes and we covered a sky area of two by two degree. And we had a large bandwidth, though the spectral resolution was not great. It is, if we convert in velocities, it is like 40, 45 kilometers per second at the redshift of 2626. We had a spatial resolution of 7.3 by 14.3 uh, um, arc minutes, uh, sorry, arc seconds. And here is the result. Here we are having a VR walk through the imaged cosmic volume. The minimum H1 mass we have detected is 4.2 times 10 to the 8 solar masses, similar to the mass of small Magellanic cloud. Uh, the minimum column density sensitivity uh, we have reached is 2 times 10 to the 19, which is also pretty amazing. We have used Caracal pipeline to reduce the data and SOFIA source finding software to detect the sources uh, within the surveyed volume. And uh, we have detected 221 uh, sources uh, in H1 from the single pointing. And uh, here is the optical image of the imaged uh, volume in Meerkat. Though the optical image doesn't look that interesting, but if we look at the right, we are looking at the radio continuums and things get more interesting, especially the central BCG is, uh, is called kite source. And right next to it, we see JW100, which has a very nice uh, tail in the radio continuum. And there are many more interesting sources in radio continuum. I'm not working on the radio continuum data by myself, but from the radio continuum maps, we can detect star formation of the galaxies down to 0.4 solar masses per year. And here are some example galaxies in A2626 that are imaged in H1. We see all different kinds of morphologies from uh, spiral to barred galaxies to even very low surface brightness galaxies. And here I come back to the distribution of galaxies again. So though in op uh, terms of redshift, optical and H1 redshifts mostly follow each other. But if we see the sky distribution, it looks uh, different. In particular, in this over densities where we see a lot of uh, optical redshifts, we do not see that many H1 detections. That is understandable because as we have seen before, uh, close to the cluster center, the galaxies are more H1 deficient or uh, H1 absent. Here are some example of H1 data products that we have for the galaxies in ABLE 2626. Here we see Deco's colored image. Here we see H1 map on the optical. 
the outermost H1 contour comes from uh, the three sigma um, called signal to noise coming from this signal to noise map. And here we see radio continuum on optical. Here we see the H1 velocity field. Here we see the H1 position velocity diagram, which is basically a cut through the optical major axis. And here we see the H1 spectrum or the global profile. And we have this information for 221 galaxies in total. So it is a lot of data to deal with and hopefully a lot of interesting signs to look forward to. And here are some interesting case studies uh, in H1. I will come back to this uh, H1 morphologies later. So the take home from this section is Meerkat is really a very sensitive telescope with its uh, large field of view. And we have detected 221 sources in H1 in the single Meerkat pointing in this uh, able to 626 volume. Now I would like to talk about the jellyfish candidate galaxies in able to 626. So the, from the optical B and V uh, images, Poisanti et al has identified six jellyfish candidate galaxies in this region. Four of them are J class one galaxies. That means they are least probable jellyfish galaxies from their optical uh, morphologies. And two of them are higher class jellyfish galaxies. That means they're more probable jellyfish galaxies from their optical morphologies. And here are the H1 Atlas pages for all these galaxies. We do not have to go to the detail of uh, all the H1 data products, but what we can see here is all these lower class galaxies are very well detected in H1, and we do not see any obvious sign of stripping in these galaxies. While the higher class jellyfish galaxies are not so well detected in H1, and they have very lower H1 masses. This is quite telling actually. So that means that the optically identified jellyfish galaxies, higher class jellyfish galaxies, are already in advanced stage of ramp pressure stripping when we look at the H1 gas content in them. So these lower class jellyfish candidate galaxies are not jellyfish galaxies anymore. So we call them non-jellyfish galaxies. Next, we wanted to understand what is the H1 content of these jellyfish candidate galaxies if we compare with the field galaxies or the other galaxies in able 2626 or in uh, other clusters. So here is the plot. Here we plot uh, H1 mass versus stellar mass. Uh, and in pentagons, we see the jellyfish candidate galaxies, which are non-jellyfish galaxies. And in stars, we see the jellyfish galaxies. So the extra stars coming here are from the JVLA observations. And uh, in blue, we are seeing the field galaxies, the stacking results from alpha alpha. In green, we see uh, the other H1 detections in able 2626. And in these other two uh, points, we see uh, from the, the H1 detections from other over densities. So what we clearly see here is a segregation that this non-jellyfish jellyfish candidate galaxies have more H1 masses than the field galaxies where the jellyfish galaxies are really um, having lower H1 masses for the stellar masses when we compare with the most field galaxies or the cluster galaxies. Next, we wanted to understand what is the star formation rate of these galaxies uh, compared to the other uh, reference samples and if they stand out. So we made a simple plot of star formation main sequence. And for that, we use the star formation main sequence from Kluver et al, because they also used WISE observations uh, that we also used for this uh, non-jellyfish galaxies and some of the jellyfish galaxies. So what we see here is both of them do not really stand out uh, in this relation. And then we wanted to compare the star formation rate and the H1 mass for these galaxies. And also we used uh, the sample of XCAS sample and we, uh, of the, uh, and we selected the galaxies of the st similar stellar mass range as the jellyfish galaxies. So what we see here is these jellyfish galaxies are having higher star formation rate compared uh, for their H1 masses when we compare with the other galaxies. So that means that though these jellyfish galaxies are very H1 deficient, they're still forming stars. The little H1 left in them is efficiently getting converted uh, into stars. So they're not yet quenched. And then I would like to focus on one particular jellyfish galaxy, JW100, for which we already have a wealth of ancillary data from MUSE and uh, from uh, ALMA. Uh, 
and um, I added the extra information on the H1. So here in uh, red, we see H1 contours, in uh, white, we see H alpha, and in blue, we see uh, CO. So we see they're mostly of similar extent, though H1 is slightly more extended than the other two phases. So what I'm interested in to understand the multi-phase interplay of um, ISM in the strip tail of JW100, and to understand the stripping efficiencies of H1 in uh, different uh, H1 depletion channels. So here I made the similar plot that I also made for GO204. Um, uh, uh, here are the different velocity channels and in different colors, we see different gas phases. So in this uh, channel, we see the, there is CO in the disk where there is no H1. And uh, in this channel, we see they are coincident all these three gas phases. And here we see that H1 is more extended than the other two gas phases. So there is some kind of anti-correlation between H1 and H2. That means wherever there is sometimes H1, there is no H2 and vice versa. So one of the reasons can be that H1 gas is more easily stripped than uh, H2 gas. But the other reason can be probably there is in situ so H2 formation happening in the, in the tails of these jellyfish galaxies from H1. So there, there is one hypothesis that uh, because of the magnetic field is draping the cold H1 gas in the tails of these jellyfish galaxies, and that's how it is preventing the thermal conduction or any kind of turbulence from the ICM. That's how the cold gas is uh, forming H2 in these uh, tails in C2. Uh, Ignasti et al. has estimated the strength of magnetic field in the tail of JW100 from the radio continuum observations. And uh, so their estimated magnetic field strength is strong enough to shield the H1 gas and form H2. So that is quite interesting. And uh, then I was interested to look at the H alpha and H1 and H2 by H1 uh, surface density ratios and to see if there is any abundance of any gas phase in the tip of the tail. And we see indeed there is uh, abundance of H1 over the other two gas phases uh, in the tip of the tail of JW100. Then I wanted to have some estimation of the strength of the different depletion channels uh, in uh, this galaxy. And to simplify our analysis, uh, we thought of uh, the most plausible depletion channels. The first one is, of course, ramp pressure stripping of the H1 gas from the uh, disk of this galaxy. And to estimate how much gas is already stripped, uh, we took the difference of the total amount of H1 gas uh, and the amount of H1 gas in the disk. And we found that at least 70% of the H1 gas is removed from the disk. The other depletion channel is, as I mentioned before, the conversion of H1 to H2. And from that, uh, for that, we have already ALMA observations of uh, H2 gas in the tail. And from that, we estimated that at least 10% of the H1 gas is getting converted to clumpy H2 gas. And then the third one is the ionization of H1 gas because of the young stars. But compared to the other depletion channels, this channel has negligible fraction. So at least 80% of the H1 gas is already stripped out of JW100. So it is indeed at a very advanced stage of ramp pressure stripping. So the take home message from this section is optically identified jellyfish galaxies are already in the advanced stage of ramp pressure stripping when we look at their H1 phase and jellyfish galaxies have higher stellar masses for their H1 masses. Next, I would like to talk about the other 215 H1 detections in Able 2626 region. Some of them are very uh, well detected in H1, so we would like to understand what environmental mechanisms are happening in these galaxies. So to do that, at first we need to quantify the environmental effects on H1 disks. So though there is probably not directly uh, correlation of the H1 asymmetry and the corresponding environmental mechanisms, it is very important uh, to quantify the amount of H1 asymmetry in a galaxy. And for that, we use uh, a mod, uh, uh, modified asymmetry parameter that was introduced by Lely et al. Uh, 
where uh, to ensure an equal contribution of all pixels to the asymmetry index and to measure the contribution from the outer parts of the H1 disk also. Because in the traditional definition of asymmetry, uh, the most uh, weightage was given in the brightest pixels, but for the H1 detections, the outer part H1 disk has mostly all the asymmetric features. So we need to also give the equal weightage to the outer part of the H1 disk. And we have to remind ourselves that in our meerkat observations, we have good sensitivity, though it is variable across the field of view because of the primary beam attenuation. And we have moderate to low linear resolution. So depending on that, though we cannot undoubtedly identify some environmental mechanisms corresponding to some kind of H1, particular H1 morphologies, broadly we can classify what physical mechanism is causing the particular H1 uh, features, if we have the information of the environments of those galaxies, if we have the H1 asymmetries, if we have the information about the H1 offset of the H1 center from the optical center of, or if we have the information on the truncation of the H1 disks. Uh, so to calculate A mod, at first we, we need a center to choose and uh, then we need to select a column density level inside which we calculate A mod. So A mod is driven by two different parameters. One is the asymmetry in the outer H1 disk, like we see here in this picture. And then another parameter is the offset of H1 center with respect to the optical center, as we see here. So it is important to calculate A mod in one particular column density for all the galaxies for the uniformity but that column density might correspond to different signal to noise for different galaxies. So we have to find a column density for a mod calculation in a way that is uh, including the most of the resolved galaxies. And we chose 25 times 10 to the 19 per centimeter square column density to measure a mod for all the galaxies in our sample. But this column density might not correspond to three sigma column density for all the galaxies. So for some of the galaxies, A mod calculation might not be meaningful. So we have classified our sample based on the significance of A mod for the galaxies. Class one is the galaxies that are resolved and that have high signal to noise at, uh, and they have three sigma column density around 25 to 35 times into the 19. And here we see two example galaxies. So in green, we see uh, the contour uh, around inside which we calculate A mod. And in black, we see three sigma column density of these galaxies. So we see that the black and the green contour is overlapping. That means A mod is meaningful for these galaxies. Then are the class two galaxies, which are unresolved and high, have high signal to noise. And their three sigma column density is also around 25 times 10 to the 19. So for them, A mod is probably not meaningful, but still we can calculate uh, H1 offset, that is the distance between the H1 center and the optical center. And then are the class three galaxies, which are also resolved and high, have high signal to noise, but their three sigma column density is more than 35 times 10 to the 19. So that means if we calculate A mod at 25 times 10 to the 19 for these galaxies, then uh, it will correspond to the, uh, column density sensitivity that is less than three sigma for these galaxies. So A mod will introduce a lot of noise. So A mod is probably not meaningful for these galaxies as well, but we can still calculate H1 offset or H1 deficiency for these galaxies. And then we also classified visually our sample just to compare with A mod. And we broadly classified in two different type of galaxies, H1 asymmetric or H1 symmetric based on purely their H1 three sigma column density contours. And as I mentioned before, there are different kinds of environments in this uh, imaged cosmic volume. One is uh, able, inside able 2626. There are galaxies that are not in part of substructure. We call them isolated galaxies, though they are not really isolated, they're in cluster environment, but for the sake of simplicity, we call them isolated galaxies. So they are purely in the cluster environment. And then there are galaxies that are in the substructures and within able to see to six. So they have group environment influenced by the cluster environment. And uh, then there are the galaxies in the swarm, which are purely in the group environment. And then we were interested in uh, seeing uh, 
uh, the relationship between A mod and H1 offset uh, to have a further understanding of both of these parameters. And we did this analysis for only class one galaxies because only for them A mod makes sense. And we see a very strong correlation between these two. And that is understandable because as I mentioned before, if the galaxies have higher H1 offset, they will have high A mod also. And uh, comparing with our visual classifications, we identified that if A mod is greater than 0.4, then the galaxies are mostly H1 asymmetric. And then if we look at the different areas in this plot, we find that there are different categories of galaxies lying in each of these regions. For example, if we look at the first quadrant where the galaxies have high A mod and low offset, so for these galaxies, this high A mod value is driven by the outer H1 asymmetry. So we can see a few example galaxies here and uh, we call them H1 asymmetry galaxies. And then there are these galaxies in the second quadrant which have high A mod and high offset. So their high A mod value is driven by high offset and we call them offset galaxies. And there are some galaxies in this upper part of second quadrant, which have very high mod and very high offset. So for these galaxies, H1 gas is already removed from the stellar disk. We call them train wreck galaxies. There are no galaxies in this third quadrant because if the, these galaxies have high offset, they will be of course uh, having high A mod. And then there are these galaxies in fourth quadrant, which have low A mod and low offset. So these are normal galaxies. And then we made this same plot and then color coded with the different environments to see if there is any segregation because of the environments. And uh, here we use green, uh, light green again for the isolated galaxies in Able 2626, dark green for the substructure galaxies and orange for the swan galaxies. We use the same color code for these three different environments for all the plots. And what we see here is the fraction of asymmetric uh, uh, galaxies is more in the substructure than the isolated galaxies. So that is quite interesting. That means that the substructures within A2626 have more H1 asymmetric galaxies than the isolated uh, ones. So probably it is simply because there are more nearest neighbors available for the substructure galaxies. So they're having more tidal interactions that is making them asymmetric in H1. And then uh, also we don't see any obvious difference in the distribution of galaxies in Able 2626 and the swarm. So that means probably uh, uh, the swarm galaxies are already undergoing some kind of pre-processing that is uh, also making them asymmetric, similar to the cluster galaxies already. And then we used H1 deficiency as an important parameter uh, to understand the difference of the different environments. And here we plot H1 deficiency as a function of projected distance and we color code in the same way. And here in histograms, we plotted the swarm galaxies and uh, in bottom, we see the phase space diagram for uh, the two different uh, environments in Able 2626. So though in the phase space, we do not see any obvious correlation, uh, in H1 deficiency, we see a correlation. Um, that means that like close to the cluster center, there are more H1 deficient galaxies. That is kind of expected. Uh, we have also seen that in Virgo and other galaxy clusters. And, uh, but if we look at the particular environments, we see that uh, within R200, uh, the most H1 deficient galaxies are isolated galaxies, but outside R200, the uh, distribution of H1 deficiency is similar for isolated substructure or the swarm galaxies. So does it mean that the group environment in Able 2626 is providing some kind of protection against the gas removal mechanisms in ABLE 2626? And what mechanisms can cause the H1 deficiencies in all these over densities? Probably these mechanisms are acting as pre-processing also in the groups of ABLE 2626 or in the swarm. So to understand that, we just simply looked at the most H1 deficient galaxies and the most H1 uh, rich galaxies. And we see a trend here. So for example, uh, for all these three most agent deficient galaxies, we see they are yellowish in optical and they have truncated or offset H1 disks. So they, they are already stopping to form stars and their H1 uh, disks are really small or offset. 
while for the most h1 rich galaxies we see they're blue in optical then they have uh, very extended h1 disks so they are still h1 rich and they are forming stars and then we made the same h1 deficiency plot and then we color coded with the different classes that i defined before just to remind ourselves class 1 galaxies are resolved and high signal to noise and their three sigma coulomb density is close to 25 times into the 19 Class two galaxies are unresolved and high signal to noise and their three sigma column density is similar, but class three galaxies are resolved and high signal to noise, but their three sigma column density is more than 35 times into the 90. So here we see a segregation of class three galaxies. All of them are actually around 1.5 or 200 or more. So that could be simply because uh, all of these galaxies are outside the primary beam. That's why we need to correct for primary beam and the, that means it is purely observational effect probably. But among the class one or the class two galaxies, we see that the class two galaxies are more H1 deficient. So that is also um, understandable because uh, class two galaxies are smaller. So probably their anchoring force is uh, small. That's why they are more easily affected by ram pressure and that makes them more H1 deficient than the class one galaxies, which are well resolved and big galaxies. And then we made the same plot, but now we color coded with H1 offset. And uh, we do not see any obvious trend between the H1 deficiency and offset. So that means that the most H1 deficient galaxies are not necessarily H1 offset. That is also kind of understandable because all the environmental mechanisms that cause H1 deficiency not necessarily cause H1 offset. For example, in the very late stage of ram pressure stripping or in case of thermal evaporation or starvation, the galaxies become small or truncated rather than being offset. So it is understandable why these uh, mechan the, there is no uh, clear correlation between these two uh, parameters. And then we made the same plot, but this time we color coded with modified asymmetry. But as I mentioned before, uh, A mod value is only uh, uh, significant for class one galaxies. So we made this plot only for class one galaxies. So the sample space has reduced and we do not see a globally a correlation. But if we look at the particular uh, environments, we see that the substructure galaxies are slightly more asymmetric than the isolated galaxies. By the way, we, here we use different symbols for the visual um, asymmetric and symmetric galaxies. So that means that the substructure galaxies are more asymmetric as we also have seen before in the A mod versus uh, H1 offset plot. But these H1 asymmetric substructure galaxies are not necessarily H1 deficient. So that means probably these galaxies are undergoing tidal interaction, but still these tidal interactions are not that strong to completely strip out the H1 gas out of these galaxies. But if we look, focus on the isolated galaxies, we see that the iso, in the isolated galaxies, the asymmetric galaxies are more H1 deficient. So that probably means that since these isolated galaxies are exposed Exposed to the cluster environment, they are more easily affected by the ram pressure stripping, and that is making these galaxies very H1 asymmetric and also at the same time H1 deficient. We then wanted to understand uh, the relationship of star formation rate with H1 properties, and we made the simple plot again that we made before for the jellyfish galaxies, um, the star formation main sequence from Kluver et al. And uh, this time we color coded with H1 deficiency. And we are interested in understanding uh, the offset of the galaxies from the star formation main sequence and what is the reason of them. And if there is any correlation with the star formation rate and the H1 deficiency for both A2626 and the swarm galaxies. So what we see here is both for the cluster and the group environment, the uh, star formation rate for these galaxies are slightly lower than the star formation main sequence. So both these environments are somehow inducing lower star formation rate than usual for uh, the normal galaxies. So probably pre-processing is already at play in the uh, swarm or in the substructures in AD2626. 
And if we look at uh, the outlier galaxies further, for example, these two galaxies here, which are very H1 deficient and which have low star formation, we identify that these are the most H1 deficient galaxies that we have seen before. And uh, these galaxies are located also very close to the cluster center. So looking at their H1 morphologies, the location and the cluster and their star formation rate and their H1 deficiency, we can tell that these galaxies are uh, potential ram pressure candidates. So the take home for uh, this section is asymmetric offset or smaller H1 disks are not necessarily the result of uh, cluster environment because we can also see that in the swarm galaxies. So this is probably imprinted by pre-processing. And the substructure galaxies in cluster are more asymmetric than the non-substructure galaxies probably uh, because uh, these substructure galaxies are having more tidal interactions, but because of these tidal interactions, they're not necessarily being H1 deficient because still this substructure environment is somehow protecting these galaxies from the overall cluster environment. And I would like to briefly talk about my future plan for the, the postdoc period and uh, uh, which I call PROVA survey. Prova means uh, light in Sanskrit and uh, also name of a goddess of power and strength. So it stands for pre-processed and backsplash galaxies in multiphase hydrogen aspect. So we have expanded our single meerkat pointing to four other meerkat pointings as we see here that goes out to three uh, R200 uh, to investigate the infalling galaxies which can already be pre-processed or the backsplash galaxies. And we want to study the impact of the global and local cosmic environment in the detailed H1 and the star formation properties of these galaxies. Our ALMA and SMA proposal to image the CO gas in some of the H1 selected uh, star forming galaxies is also accepted. So we will also have information on the H2 gas content for some of these galaxies. And then we also have done INTH alpha imaging that will provide information about the ionized gas in these galaxies. So we will have information about all these three different gas phases out to 3R200 and we'll investigate all kinds of environmental mechanisms uh, that is happening here. I'm very excited about that project and um, I'll leave with you the summary Thanks for having the patience to listen to my long talk and um, I will take questions now. Thank you, Tirna. Congratulations and thank you for the very interesting and good uh, talk. And if there are questions, please uh, raise your hand and or write in the chat uh, your question. In the meantime, that we wait for uh, the question, Tirla, which is the main challenge uh, as a woman uh, in science in India for you? Um, so in India, I mean, I was doing undergrad in physics and masters in physics, and uh, women were very underrepresented uh, in that field. So there are only like ten percent or less than ten percent women in uh, in my class. And there were also not many female professors uh, to have as a role model. So I was always underconfident there. I mean, I could always see probably because of the way of upbringing, men were always more confident about like the, about their answer. Sometimes they were wrong, but I was, even I was like having a right answer. I didn't have the confidence enough to talk about it. So, and then I went for a project, uh, doing a project in one of the premier institutes in India. And there also I saw less than 10% women in doing PhD. So, I mean, that's why that was one of my motivation to actually apply for PhD in abroad, because I, I really wanted to have that confidence as a person and also to explore new possibilities. So, um, and I think in Netherlands during my PhD, I had a lot of uh, insp uh, inspiration from the women in my collaboration. The, there were a lot of women leaders and I also started everything from scratch there. So that, that really helped me to build my confidence and uh, to become like uh, really confident about my work. And so. Oh, it is a good point to this one. And now, yes, Sarah, you can uh, talk if you want. 
Yeah, sorry, I'm going to mute myself. I hope you can hear me. I don't have the greatest connection, so I'm not going to okay. turn on my video, but I hope yeah, you can yeah, hear Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah. So I was wondering um, if you could discuss a little bit what are the implications of the anti-correlation between H1 and CO that you've been discussing, and especially if there is any relationship with SARF emission efficiency. Yeah, so with the... Um, the plot first. Yeah, so by the anti-correlation of H1 and CO, I meant uh, that where there is H1, sometimes there is no CO and vice versa. So one of the reason is, as I mentioned that, for example, here we see H1 uh, already in the tip of the tail where there is no CO. So that is probably that H1 is more easily stripped uh, simply than, uh, than the molecular gas. The other reason can be that uh, in the tails of these jellyfish galaxies, H1 is getting converted into H2. And that can happen if there are like uh, there are magnetic fields discovered in the tails of the jellyfish galaxies, and uh, so this magnetic field can actually um, shield the H two H one gas and from the further interaction with the ICM, and then that can cause uh, the uh, conversion of the H one to H two in this in the uh, in situ environment in the tail. And that's how the, uh, if the H1 gas is converted into H2, it also forms stars. And uh, we have seen that uh, there are enhanced uh, H2 uh, formation in the tail of the jellyfish galaxies of, uh, from our GASP survey uh, work by uh, Moriti et al. Uh, so yes, yeah, so in the jellyfish galaxies, uh, uh, they are in a very special place when they're falling into the cluster. Often there are in situ star formations happening in the tails because the H1 gas is getting converted in H2 and then that is converting into stars. Thank you. Uh, I hope I could answer any of this. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, uh, me too, uh, I have a question. Uh, for the more than 200 galaxies that you detected in H1, do you have a preferential optical morphology or, I, I mean, are they all these galaxies or you have a mixing of morphology in optical with the, for all these galaxies with respect to the distribution of morphologies in the, in the cluster, of course. Uh, okay. Um, yes, I mean, uh, we can see that uh, the similar morphology density relation also uh, in this cluster environment that closer to the center of the cluster, there are more early type galaxies also from optical point of view, and there are more late type galaxies in, um, in the outskirts. Probably I can show you one of the, I'm not sure why is that um, figure, but uh, so, uh, so there are also a couple of substructures as I mentioned in, uh, in this over density. And sometimes inside those substructures also, we see the segregation of, uh, uh, galaxies, meaning that closer to the center of the substructure, there are more early type galaxies, and outside, there are more late type galaxies. Okay. So, it is quite interesting that these kind of uh, segregations we also see not, not only in the cluster but also in the substructures within the cluster. Okay, but in general, I, I see the picture that you're showing that I'm there are all kinds of galaxies of uh, yes, yes, late type, not early type. So. Yeah, that is true. Yes. Okay, thanks. Any other question? If I can add something, I, since oh. Tierna cited the work of mine, it's yeah. just a comment more than a question, Tierna. Um, sure. When you say that we discovered an increased efficiency of conversion from H1 into H2 in the tail, that is actually true also in the disks. Yeah. Because if you remember, we find a lot of molecular gas in the disk of yeah, JW100. Right. And so we speculated that even there within the disk, there is an efficient conversion of H1 into H2. That's yes. it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? If not, thanks again to Tirna for the beautiful and very interesting uh, talk. And see you in a month for the next Laura Bassi talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you bye.
Thank you. Bye bye. Ok. Ecco, scusate per il casino col video. Non so no, no, no vabbè, dai, è andato. Io ho fatto ho visto anche... che Marco ha corso nel tuo. Eh, bisogna spegnere il